Futurecast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It's another beautiful Saturday morning here in North Carolina, and this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Jeremy Clevenger Fitness, who we featured on episode 145. If you haven't heard that episode yet, I encourage you to go back and take a listen, especially if you're struggling to get and stay in shape as a busy leader. I hope you're having a great day. I have a quick question for you. Do you listen to these podcasts on audio or have you tried watching them on video? If you haven't watched these interviews on video, I encourage you to give it a try. I have a growing following now on YouTube, so go on over there and check it out. Uh, And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I have another great show lined up for you today. But before we get started, I just want to remind you to take a look at the leadership books on my website. I've written three leadership books, and I recommend you start with I Have the Watch First. It's filled with 22 short stories that will help you become a leader worth following. It's a quick read, and most people finish it in less than three hours. It's also available on Kindle and Audible, so you can listen in your car or while working out. So check out all my books either on Amazon or my website, johnsrenny.com. Well, that is it. Today, we're going to be talking about building unstoppable teams, and my guest is Alden Mills. Alden is a former Navy SEAL platoon commander and inventor of the perfect push-up. He grew that company from just a half a million dollars in revenue to $63 million in just three years. He is the author of Unstoppable Teams, The Four Essential Actions of High-Performance Leadership, and I'm honored to have him on the show to talk about what it takes to build an unstoppable team. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Alden Mills. Alden is a best-selling author and keynote speaker. He is a former Navy SEAL platoon commander, Division I athlete, and co-founder and CEO of Perfect Fitness. He is the author of Unstoppable Teams, The Four Essential Actions of High-Performance Leadership. I am excited to have him on the show to learn how to create unstoppable teams. So, Alden, welcome to the show. John, it's great to be here, and I love what you're doing with Deep Leadership. Well, thanks. It's an honor to have you on the show. I, I'm uh, I'm excited to hear your story, to learn from you, uh, you know, your your journey as a Navy SEAL, an entrepreneur, and now in the speaking world and writing world. So I'm excited to hear your journey and and really share what you've learned over that journey with our listeners. So start us off. Um, tell us a little bit about, about your background. As I understand it, you overcame childhood asthma and to become a nationally ranked rower and eventually a Navy SEAL. What drove you throughout your youth? And then why did you want to become a Navy SEAL in the first place? Well, I'll tell you uh, that I'll answer the first question, the, the last question first here. Becoming a Navy SEAL, that was a natural extension of the sport I was doing. The bigger question is, like, okay, what drove me? Like, how how did I, you know, an asthmatic kid and, oh, you want more details? I was terrible at ball sports. I mean, I, here's a kid who scored against his own team on basketball, lacrosse, soccer, and hockey. And, and oh, by the way, I found out I was asthmatic and also born with smaller than average size lungs. And I found that all out in one fateful day when I was 12, going to the big city of Wista, Massachusetts, (laughs) with my mom, who grew up in a small town in central Mass. And, you know, the doctor was very, very kind of nonchalant. He's like, here's his problem. He's asthmatic and he's got smaller than average sized lungs. He needs to learn the game of chess and lead a less active lifestyle. Right. Wow. I, I, I remember going, oh, my God, how am I going to learn the game of chess? I suck at checkers. Like, this isn't going to work. And my mom was the one talking about deep leadership that really kind of gave me, she gave me my first leadership experience. And that was 
hey, we'll go get you the medicine, but no one defines what you can or can't do but you. Mm. You get to decide. It's up to you. It's your choice. So what are you going to do? Do you want to learn chess or do you want to go try a sport? And of course, I didn't get it that day or I didn't get that month. But the consistency of, so what if you scored on your own team in basketball? Go try another sport. Mm. Go try another sport. And those attempts got me to try out rowing and rowing, you know, eight oars in a boat, sitting on your butt, going backwards for a long period of time. That was transformative. And that helped me go to the Naval Academy. And while at the Naval Academy, I knew I had to serve afterwards. And I was like, well, where's a place that is most similar to the sport of rowing? And I found SEAL Team. Hmm. So the real initial snowball event was mom. Hmm. Interesting. So you're faced with, and again, we're going to talk about this throughout the show, you are faced with an obstacle at a young age. And what you're you're saying is it didn't it didn't stop you from pursuing whatever you're interested in doing. Yeah. Um, you know, you you make it sound, and and I and I mean this in the positive light, like, oh, you, <laughs> you had this, you had this obstacle. And I actually I I'm on the speaking circuit and I talk to lots of audiences about, yeah, we all have this obstacle. You may not have smaller lungs or asthma, but maybe you have nearsightedness. Maybe it's a physical ailment. Maybe it's a mental ailment. Maybe it's a attention ailment. Maybe it's a, I can't do it ailment, right? We all have these obstacles. And, you know, I think mom's opinion was like, hey, it's either going to be an obstacle or an opportunity. How are you going to deal with it? Mm. Well, it turns out, for a large majority of asthmatics, and I don't mean this for everybody, but you can, with intense physical exercise and training, you can really put that in check. Mm. And if you really look at ways to look at the gift of how to overcome that obstacle, that can really propel you forward. Mm. And so I encourage people, like we're always running into obstacles. Uh yeah, I'll give you a very recent obstacle. I had heart failure two months ago. Mm, I'm wow. training for, uh, I'm on the seven summit kick and I was going to train to ski to the South Pole and I collapsed. Turns out I had an inflamed heart. Now, not an obstacle I was expecting. Mm. And, you know, is it going to stop you or is it like, oh, okay, well, we can slow down for a little while, take some meds, figure out what it is, and then figure out new ways to take control. We are going to run into those obstacles throughout the rest of our lives. The question will be, is it an obstacle or is it an opportunity? Mm. Yeah, I like that what you what you said there. And how did um, how that mindset and, and what you went through to get into the academy and then get into the SEAL teams, what in, in your experiences when you were in the SEAL teams, how did those experiences help you? In, the, in in your next endeavor, which is ends up being an entrepreneur and leading a leading a a, a startup company, um, what are some what are some things you learned throughout your time in the military and even in the academy that you that that helped you for the rest of you, the things that you did in your life? Let's start with the academy. The academy was the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> yes, Charles Dickens story, right? And let me explain to you why it was the worst of times for me. It was the worst of times for me because that was the first time in my life I failed a class. Mm. And then I failed another one. Mm. And then I got a D in performance. And I got a I got failing grades and uh room inspections. And I, I failed almost everything I could fail there at one shape. And I wasn't used to failing. And all of a sudden, I had come from being, eh, I'd say, a medium-sized fish, but in a small pond. And I'm in the pond where there are much bigger fish than me at the Naval Academy. And they were way better at things that I thought, well, I, I could be good at all this stuff. And it turns out I wasn't. And it took me a little while to really come to grips with the fact that, hey, it's okay 
you're not going to be great at a bunch of things, but know what you're good at and learn to surround yourself with people who are good at the things you're not good at, which means learn how to build relationships with all kinds of different people. And that was one of the great things of the Naval Academy. It is a great cross-section of America, right? It's all 50 states and provinces, uh, regions around the world that are associated with the United States that allowed to come to the Naval Academy. All socioeconomic backgrounds were there. And I really got to learn what I was good at and a whole bunch of stuff that I wasn't great at. And I learned how to build the first real teams at the Naval Academy. So that that's part one. And then when you go to SEAL team, man, does SEAL team teach you a lot about yourself just in training. And one of the great things it teaches me, and, they, and I talk about it uh, in my second book, is we all have this conversation, a conversation that's going on in here, a conversation that I'll call between the whiner and the whisperer. One that's saying all the reasons why we can't do something. And the other one that's a lot quieter saying, try again, get up, keep going. You can do it. And when you learn to quiet the whiner and embrace the whisperer, you're learning your weapons platform. And that's a big piece of what they talk about. And then SEAL Team is, you know, you don't get any fancy guns or cool weapons of any sort when you go through SEAL training. The only weapon that they're working on is the one right here. And then the swim buddy between this, and I'm pointing to the heart and the body, of the brain housing group, right? The weapons platform is our brain housing group. That's what they would say all the time. You know, the body obeys the brain. It ain't the other way around. And the weapons platform is that connection between the brain and our body and learning to harness the very few things that we can control is what SEAL training is all about. Mm -hmm. And I distill those key components and everything can snowball off of those, but learning to control our thoughts, our thoughts bleed into our emotions and build our attitudes into our focus where we decide to put things and the beliefs that we want to accept. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're right. And, um, you know, you see a lot of people derailed because of, because of their mind, right? They, they, they convince themselves they can't move forward, right? They listen to the, uh, the whiner, not the whisperer sometimes, and then they derail themselves. And if you just take that one more step, you know, and just keep going, uh, that's that's what you need to do to overcome, you know, even the toughest obstacles. I, that's what I wanted to transition to. You know, you're you were this amazing entrepreneur. You you had this amazing entrepreneurial journey. Uh, you developed the the perfect uh, fitness line of exercise products, right? I remember the perfect push up uh, being, you know, ads on TV. So you're that guy that designed that thing, or you know, and you brought this company, Perfect Fitness, into the world and. In three years, you went from sales of a half a million dollars to 63 million in three years. Tell us a little bit about that story and what were some of the challenges you faced to, to getting that level of growth in such a short amount of time? Oh, we didn't have any challenges. It was, it was super <laughs> okay. easy, no problems whatsoever. Oh, I was born to be an entrepreneur, you know, overnight success that took 10 years, <laughs> right? Right. I, I'm really clear with everybody in the audience. People will be like, oh, my God, I can't believe you. You're the overnight success. And then I'm like, yeah, but it took 10 years to get there. Absolutely. You hear, yeah. I started the first business, PT Metrics, failed miserably. Started Body Rev, failed miserably. And it's with the last 25,000 that's really out of a 1.5 million it was really my wife's credit cards that it was a Hail Mary. Mm. Hey, let's do something that's really simple and super focused because we had created a Swiss Army knife product before. And we had no idea what we had in our hands. We just knew we were going to keep trying. And I I really want to express to everybody, uh, do we have time to tell a brief story? Yeah, absolutely. 
So I mentioned briefly, I, I raised this million and a half dollars from 37 of my closest friends and family members, uh, some classmates from the Naval Academy as well. I was very passionate about not letting them down. And I then come out with this wonderful, the greatest fat burning product in the world that no one ever bought called Body Rev. Um, and I learned $1,475,000 worth of ways not to launch that product. And I go to my five investors that were, I thought, the best opportunity to raise a little bit more money. They're all hedge fund guys. And I'm bringing in my new product that I'm going to show them. I'm finally making the pivot after four years of mm. working on it. And they hold up their hand. They go, uh, stop. We, we don't want to see any new product. All in and furthermore, you're not going to get any more money. Mm. Show you this thing. It's called, uh, see this? It's called a cash flow statement. You don't have any. <laughs> and uh, you don't even have enough money to pay the manufacturers, the accountants, the lawyers. Yet your business is over. As a matter of fact, it's so over. The only option for you is to go bankrupt. Mm. And we recommend you do that right away. Your wife is pregnant with number three child at the time. Um, and about, you know, we think you're starting to embarrass yourself. Come on, go get a job. That was a really pivotal moment wow. because the other product I was showing them was the perfect push up. And they didn't want to invest in it. I could have flushed them all, by the way. I was getting some advice to do that, but I wasn't, I didn't want to do that. Like everyone wanted, they, I felt like I had learned off of their dime what not to do. And now I'd figured out what to do. And I came back and I had a small team of four people. And I said, we didn't get the money, but we have this opportunity. And here's the opportunity. Imagine what it would be like if in 90 days, this little gizmo holding up a functional model of a perfect push-up, imagine if this takes off and, and becomes the product we were hoping to build from the, you know, we know what's going to happen if we go behind the bankruptcy door. We can see very clearly where our lives are going to go. But imagine if we just go 90 more days. Mm. 87 days later, we launched the perfect push-up. Now, we had a whole host of issues after that, right? Going and scaling an inventory business from a half a million, and by the way, a large majority of that half million came from the body rep product because we only launched a uh, perfect push-up uh, in September of 2006. So that's really two and a half years that we went wow. to 63 million. <laughs> And we we could have done more, but we didn't have any more product. Yeah, was, yeah. Right? And you're talking about hundreds of truckloads of moving. And we we're drinking from a fire hose, and we we're making all kinds of mistakes. And and no sooner did we become the fastest growing consumer products company on the Inc. 500, number four overall, that 2009 hits. And now we're looking at the second Great Depression, and I'm at a... I go from hero to zero and I'm thrown into workout and they're telling me to go bankruptcy for my second time. Oh, wow. And then we sell the business and I work for the new business and we grow it up some more. And there was an opportunity to almost go bankrupt another time. And then we sold the business again. So when people say, tell me the story, I'm like, there's a lot more to this story than, yeah, Alden may have penned out the idea on a napkin, but it took a total of probably 25 people yeah. to bring that product to market. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. This podcast is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger Fitness. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. 
And for most people, the one area they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. But how do you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best person for the job. Now, don't struggle on your own. Put Jeremy Clevenger on your team. Jeremy will work with you to help take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. Now, I've worked with Jeremy for the past year, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So if you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at jeremyclevengerfitness.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. They live by a simple philosophy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. It's really interesting because I think you're right. I think we like to hear of the old and overnight success. So we, you know, I mean, I see it on Instagram, you know, they'll show a picture of a guy in, with a fancy car and, and a private jet behind him. And it says hustle. That's yeah. all you got to do is hustle. Right. That's and then you're, you, you got it. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, I've been an entrepreneur now for six years and I know what you're going through, you know, there it, it's a roller coaster ride of emotions and, uh, and wins and losses and the wins are, they feel like the greatest thing ever. And the losses just seem just never ending. They seem yeah. never ending. Right. Exactly. You know, like you said, you, you, you got to the end many times, you know, to where it's, it's bankruptcy or do we just try to press forward for another month or so? And, and people don't understand that's the reality of when you start a business, the, the guy with the private jet in the, uh, in the fancy car with the hustle, you know, that's, that's not the likely scenario that you're going to ever come up with, you know? No, so. And I would also caution people if they think Oh, I should become an entrepreneur because I want the fancy car and the jet. Yeah. Don't become an entrepreneur. If yeah. That's the only reason. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, that goes out the window really quickly when you start facing some real friction, some real financial hardships. Yeah. So... Yeah, so so let's uh, switch to to your books. I want to talk about just your first book real quick. Uh, mm-hmm. It's called Be Unstoppable. And as I understand it, you wrote that to teach your sons of these lessons. So you have four sons, is that right? And uh, yeah. and you did that to as a way to teach them lessons of like self belief. Uh, you know this this idea of an unstoppable dream realization, team building, and and continuous improvement uh, was was part of that. So. Uh, tell us about that first book. What what were you trying to do with that first book? In 2002, one of my good friends and close teammates was the first Navy SEAL to die in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And that was Neil Roberts. And when you go do a deployment, they ask you to write a just-in-case letter. And a just-in-case letter is if you come back on your shield, they have something more than a flag to give to your next of kin. I wrote three of them. I had three different platoons. And each time that my next of kin was my mom, my dad, and my brother, right? I wasn't married and I didn't have children. Neil had to write a just-in-case letter to an 18-month-old boy. Mm. And at the time, Jennifer was pregnant to what would be our first son. And I really wondered what Neil had written. I'd never written a letter like that. So uh, I spent time on airplanes writing a letter to my unborn son as a just-in-case letter. And then I kind of put it away. I didn't pay attention to it until she was pregnant with number two. First one was Henry. And then Charlie came along. I wrote him a letter. And then I did it again for John, number three. And then by the time I got to William, I was like, you know, I'm going to try and codify this and make it more interesting than do this, don't do that kind of letters. They weren't that great. And I went on a journey to write a book 
that was my just in case letter to my four boys. Mm. That's really all it was. I was going to self publish it. Uh, and I really kind of thought of like, what do I want this to be about? And what I really wanted it to be about, which is the title of the book, is I want them to be unstoppable at going after their dreams. And how do you teach that? And the way I decided to teach it in the book was to create a parable that was based on a fictitious seaside town called Up to You, where everybody's born and they receive a boat when they're born and it's their boat for the rest of their life. And they can modify it and change it. And they can even learn how to go outside the harbor and go across the ocean, across the horizon. And they learn the master and commander's code. And that code, I make an acronym out of called You Persist, which is what I want you to do is to keep persisting. And uh, I ended up getting it published and then it started getting translated into multiple languages. And that is what originally put me on the speaking circuit. Oh, that's great. It's such a great, important message. In fact, it's, it's, it's you know, when I'm looking to hire people, I'm always looking for a story of perseverance. Tell me, you know, when I'm interviewing people, tell me something you've overcome in your life. I want to see if, especially as, as an entrepreneur and, you, you know, and you have a small team, you have to have a group of people that are unstoppable, that uh, if they come up against an obstacle, that they're they're trying to figure out a way how to go around it, over it, through it, under it. They're they're not going to be stopped dead in their tracks. And that that has always been the most important characteristic as I look for uh, employees, and that's I tend to hire a lot of uh, former military guys and gals for that very reason, is because Absolutely. they typically have been through some stuff and they've overcome it. Yes. Yeah. I I think that's the single most important trait there is. And, you know, I dedicated the whole book to it and talked about these eight actions of how to persevere, how to press on, how to not give up your ship. <laughs> yes. The flag behind you, which I love. I mean, that's yes. right front and center in the rotunda at the Naval Academy. It yep. is all about don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a powerful message. Now you've 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 kind of uh, taken that idea of unstoppable being an unstoppable and creating it now for teams and leadership. So that's kind of interesting. So your uh, your latest book called Unstoppable Teams, the the four essential actions of high performance leadership. Um, why did you now take it and pivot now to the leadership side of it and the team side of it? That book took five years to write. The first book took 10 years to write. And <laughs> as I was out on the speaking circuit, you know, it was interesting. People at first were like, wow, we don't really need to hear about persistence. We really need to hear about leadership. Mm. And the more I started thinking about it, I was like, actually, we have these three levels of leadership. And I think of it like a pebble in a pond. Yeah. And the pebble is us. It's our action, right? And we're on this beautiful, crystal clear, dead calm pond. And we drop that pebble in and think of it like these three rings radiating out. That first ring is us. It's how we lead ourselves. That is be unstoppable. That is about the things that we can control and lead ourselves become then how we lead others, which is the second ring, which is unstoppable teams. The third ring is then the culture. Teams, there's nothing more, if you look at a team, a team is nothing more than a reflection of its leader. A culture is nothing more than a reflection of the actions that are consistently taken by their teams. Now, you could say, well, no, Alden, uh, our culture is defined on this marble board over here. <laughs> in the foyer. Yes. Like, no, no, that is an aspirational definition. The actual is what's going on day to day. Mm. Now, good for you. Let's close the gap between those two. So it became a natural extension of, okay, now I've helped. And by the way, the T of you persist is team up. Mm. And so it became a natural extension to go from be unstoppable to unstoppable teams. 
That makes a lot of sense. Now we've learned how to lead ourselves. Now let's go help and lead others. I love that. I love the idea of these, uh, the, 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 a pebble in the water. And and I always think of that too, as like our influence as leaders, you know, we, we, it spreads out from us and we do have that influence on others. And I always say that we want to leave a positive uh, legacy versus a negative legacy. A lot of leaders lead, leave a lot of problems in their wake. And so the idea of lead yourself first, create that, the right ring, you know, and then lead your team. And then you grow from out from that. And uh, then it's the culture. I love that analogy. One of the things you say, and this is interesting, is that um, you say that uh, in order to be um, a great team, or let's say the, the more you care for your teammates, the more uh, they will dare for the team. Why? Why? This is interesting because it, we don't think about caring that much. We don't talk about caring that much. But you come from a Navy SEAL perspective, an entrepreneur's perspective, and you're saying caring is powerful. Why is caring so powerful? This is going to sound very cliche-ish. Yeah. I don't mean it to sound this way, but I want it to stick in people's heads. Caring leads to daring. Mm. Why? We are born selfish. We're looking for food, water, go through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We are looking at, hey, what's in it for me? There is that selfish component. Along the way, we start to realize during our journey of life, hey, selfish only gets me so far. If I'm too selfish, other people, they're, they're not going to help me because, by the way, I can't do it all. I'm not built to do everything. I need to create a team to go after bigger and bigger goals. Like you being an entrepreneur, you couldn't create your company by yourself you needed other people to help you to create that same with me and perfect push-up i need people to help me get through the naval academy <laughs> yeah. get through the seal team right and when you start to realize that you have to move from selfish to selfless mm. and if you know that people are already selfish when people show up on a team Typically, the first thing they're doing is, well, wait a minute, I got to take care of myself. Am I going to hit my rewards? Am I going to do the things? I got to make sure I get the good press. And if you're the leader, you're saying, hey, you don't have to worry about that. I got your back. And then now they're not focused behind their backs. They're not looking in the rearview mirror. They're like, no, Alden or John or Sally or Annie, they have proven they've got my back. I don't have to worry about mm. those selfish needs. I get to think about the selfless needs of the team. And now they're not looking in the rearview mirror. They're looking forward. And if they know, think of it like climbing and you're all roped in. And maybe John or Sally is on the lead now. And they're like, ooh, this is a big precipice that I've got to jump across. But you know what? If I don't make it, I'm still attached to the team and they got my back. Mm. I'm going to be okay. And that propels people to do something they wouldn't typically do by themselves because they know they're supported by a bunch of other selfless teammates that are propelling them forward. And that's how we do more than we originally thought was possible. But it starts with the element of caring for each other. It's really interesting. It's 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 very similar. I tell very similar things in my in in my books uh, about this idea of 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 caring and trust. And if you feel like your leader has your back, your teammates have your back, you're willing to stretch. You're willing to push yourself. You're willing to take risks. Absolutely. Right. Yes. It, you see it, you see in the company where when everyone's afraid of making the decision because they're going to get fired or written up. Everyone keeps their mouth shut and nobody takes risks, nobody takes chances, right? So you get a stagnant organization. It dies right there when you have a boss or, an, or a culture where uh, failure is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a death blow, right? So everyone just, you know, does their job, keeps their mouth shut and they go home. And, and, you, and, and that's when innovation dies. That's when daring dies. That's when uh, you're you're not able to take your business to the next level because everyone's just you know, keeping their mouth shut and, and just doing their job and going home. And that's, 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 it's really the death of a company when that happens. So the idea of caring and people don't, you know, people think it's a, it's a soft term and uh, it's like, it's, it's a soft leadership skill, but it's really 
what's going to get you the hard results at the end of the day by having these things like caring, loving, respect, you know, these things are actually going to give you, you know, revenue, orders, EBITDA, you know, those things are, 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 are you know, question. Yep. Yeah. I couldn't agree anymore. And, you know, people will hear like, well, what does care lead to? And I'm like, oh, squared, care squared, which is where you want to get to, is love. Mm, Yep. It is the highest emotion we've got, right? The two basic emotions in life are love and fear. Everything else can be derived from it. Yeah. And what we want, and by the way, people want to be loved. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can create an organization where people are loved and they love coming to work and they love working with customers, yes, then you're going to have all those things you say. You know, I've done a lot of work with Marriott Corporation and they have a very simple HR policy philosophy. It's called take care. Yeah. You know what take care is based off of? The original mission statement of Mr. Mrs. Marriott founders take care of your associates and the associates will take care of the customers and the customers will come back. Yep. 95 years later, the largest hoteling company in the world is based on take care. That does not mean you just have to be soft and cuddly, you know, SEAL instructors care so much that they want to make sure that you get the full benefit experience and they don't want anything but the best to get through that training. They care. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, tell us a little bit about what you do as a speaker, trainer, coach. Um, You know, you're on the speaker circuit. Uh, How can people um, or what can people expect if they hire you to come out and speak or do training at at, uh, their company? Thank you for asking that. (laughs) I speak on the three levels of leadership. Uh, First level, I call unstoppable mindset. Second one is unstoppable teams. And the third is unstoppable culture. I love to speak to audiences, but I do not do canned speeches. I love customizing them. So I really like to get deep in understanding what they're trying to get across, what their desired outcomes are, and they can expect me to go all in for them. I'm a storyteller at heart, and I use several frameworks that I've created over the last 35 years of leadership. And in some, I have a limited number of coaching slots that I do for executives and their C-suite. Excellent. And how can uh, people find out more about what you do as far as speaking and training uh, and uh, and all your books? How can they find that? They can go to Alden, A-L-D-E-N, dash Mills, M-I-L-L-S dot com. And okay. everything is right there at Alden dash Mills dot com. Fantastic. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put links in the show notes for that, uh, for that resource. And uh, I really encourage listeners, you're listening in and you're hearing uh, stories about what it takes to become unstoppable. Go out and find these two books that he's written. Uh, and if you want to learn how to be unstoppable uh, personally, and also with your teams and with your companies, and uh, these are these are fantastic resources to help you learn. Learn from the people that have been there before you and to have the battle scars, and they've learned the lessons. So that's the best way you can become a better leader. So uh, Alden, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your stories, sharing these two books, sharing your lessons that you've learned throughout your career. John, I am so grateful for what you're doing with Deep Leadership, and I love the message you're sending. So it's an honor to be here and support you. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying, take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Electric.
Electricast. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonise your mind, body, and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together we explore vibrations, frequencies and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Step inside the marketing mirror to uncover marketing secrets, discover gems, tactics, lessons and campaigns you can use next gen or fundamentals grab the marketing magic to improve your marketing and win more business electric acid